we have finally amassed enough knowledge that we're in a position that we can start actually analyzing experimental data. And in this lecture, we're going to look at the first step of that, which would be indexing a cubic powder diffraction pattern. To begin with, let's look at a very simple picture of how an X-ray powder diffractometer would work. You can run a powder diffractometer in one of two modes, either in a transmission mode or in what is a reflection mode. The reflection mode is called the Bragg-Brentano mode, and we're going to use that for illustrated purposes in this lecture. The key components are, one, an X-ray source. So this is going to be some source where we generate monochromatic x-rays. Typically that would be by bombarding a metal target with hot electrons from a filament. The most common kinds of targets would be a copper x-ray source or a molybdenum x-ray source. The x-ray beam comes out of the detector, comes down and hits our sample, which is tilted at some angle theta with respect to the incoming x-ray beam. And when we are at the proper angle, x-rays can be diffracted at an equivalent angle going out. If this angle is theta, then this angle with respect to the incoming X-ray beam would be two theta. Another key point is that we want our detector to be at the same distance uh, from the sample as the X-ray source. And the circle that is a constant distance from the sample is called the goniometer circle. As I've drawn the image here, you can imagine that the X-ray source and the detector would both move upwards, making increasing theta and two theta angles. In practice, a more common geometry would be that the X-ray source, being the heaviest component in this setup, is fixed, and we just tilt the sample and move the detector. And we do that in a locked motion so that the detector is always at an angle two theta when the sample makes an angle theta with the incoming beam. That's the general picture. And if we were to look a little bit closer at what conditions lead to diffraction, we would see that we have to meet two conditions. So first of all, the angle, theta and two theta, have to be the right angle so we can get constructive interference from specific Bragg planes in our crystal. Right? Those Bragg planes will have a specific spacing, and that specifies the angle. Now, even if we're at that angle, the lattice planes that are scattering the x-rays have to be normal to the incoming and outgoing beams. Another way to say that is remember that we had a reciprocal space lattice vector that's normal to the planes. We called that G in the last lecture. And that reciprocal space vector that defines the planes because it's normal to them must be parallel to the vector S minus S naught, the scattering vector minus the incoming vector. Now, in a powdered sample, we would have thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of small crystals in that sample. And most of the crystals at any given point in time are not constructively scattering or diffracting x-rays. Here I show a simplified picture where the crystals that are shown in blue, right, they have the proper lattice spacing, and those crystals are oriented so that the lattice planes are perpendicular to this vector S minus S naught, and in that case we will get diffraction. Now there's also some crystals which I've shown in yellow here. Those have the proper spacing of the planes for this angle, but they're not oriented correctly, and so therefore they're not going to diffract the x-rays here. They might diffract them out in another direction. Let's say, remember there's a whole cone of scattering, but here we're just looking at one direction. I've also shown some crystals which I've highlighted in green, and their lattice planes are actually oriented such that S minus S naught would be in the perpendicular direction here. So the planes are oriented correctly, but the spacing between the planes is not correct for this angle. So they also do not contribute to the diffraction. The idea of a powder diffraction experiment is because we have tens of thousands of crystals all oriented randomly, there's always going to be some number of crystals that are oriented in the right shape, so we'll see constructive interference when we get to the right Bragg angles. Now, what does a 
X-ray powder diffraction pattern look like? Here is the X-ray powder diffraction pattern for alpha polonium, which has a simple cubic structure. Right? So this is practically the simplest crystal structure you can think of. We have a primitive cubic Bravais lattice, and we have one atom at each lattice point. And this is what the X-ray powder diffraction pattern for this material would look like. Now, how can we analyze this? How can we look at this diffraction pattern and learn some information about our crystal? Well, let's start by considering the two theta angles at which we're seeing constructive interference. Right, so you can go in and have a closer look at the computer at what angles give you constructive interference, what angles give you diffraction. And these are the two theta values of those peaks. I believe there's 14 peaks that are found between 2 theta of 20 and 2 theta of 140. Now let's also remember the relationship between the spacing of the lattice planes and the theta angle. So here's Bragg's law, 2d sine theta equals lambda, lambda being the wavelength of the incident radiation. Well, lambda is a constant. So what that means is that when sine theta goes down, d must go up and vice versa. So remember, sine theta reaches a minimum of 0 at 0 degrees 2 theta. And then it's going to reach a maximum at theta equals 90 which would be 2 theta equals 180. So we see that the peaks down here at low angles, those correspond to large values of DHKL. These are going to be scattering off the planes that are far apart from one another. And at high angles, these peaks correspond to a small DHKL. And so these are peaks that arise from scattering off of lattice planes that are close to one another. Well, the next step would be to quantify the interplanar spacing that goes with each peak in the diffraction pattern. So I've made a table here where I've started by including my two theta values that I get from reading my powder diffraction pattern. And then using Bragg's law, I've rearranged to solve for D. This is a copper radiation source, which is typical. And so the wavelength of the radiation is 1.54 angstroms. If I were to take, let's say, this first value, 26.5 divided by 2 gives me theta, and 2 times sine of that value, 13.25, would give me a D spacing of 3.36 angstroms. And I've just repeated that calculation for every peak in the pattern. So now I have a list of D spacings that lead to constructive interference. What this is telling me is that in this crystal, there are lattice planes that are separated by one another at these distances. Well, what can I do from that? Well, we could think a little bit more about the relationship between HKL and the interplanar spacing D. So for a cubic crystal, 1 over D squared is equal to h squared plus k squared plus l squared over a squared. We could rearrange this and take the square root of both sides, and we would get this expression for the d spacing or the interplanar spacing between different lattice planes. And when you look at it in this way, you can see that the maximum spacing is going to happen when this denominator is a minimum. And the denominator basically can't get any smaller than 1, right? H, K, and L all have to be integers. So if we were to look at the 1, 0, 0 set of lattice planes that intercept the A axis at one unit cell, at the origin, and so forth and so on, the spacing between those planes would be A squared divided by 1 squared plus 0 squared plus 0 squared, which is 1. And that spacing would just be A, the cubic lattice constant. Well, you can actually look at this picture and see that the spacing between planes is equal to the lattice constant. Note that the 0, 1, 0 lattice planes would be equivalent. Their spacing would also be 1 lattice constant. And the 0, 0, 1 lattice planes are also equivalent. 
So these three sets of lattice planes all have an interplanar spacing equal to A, the lattice constant. And this is the largest interplanar spacing we're going to see in this crystal. Now D, H, K, L cannot be any larger than we get for these three planes. So if we come back to our table of D spacings and we assume that the first peak could be this 100 zero, zero peak, then we can make the assignment that the lattice constant would be 3.36 angstroms. If that's true, then knowing the lattice constant, we should be able to calculate the d-spacings of other sets of lattice planes. Here are what would be the next three lattice planes in terms of decreasing interplanar spacing. So the 110 plane the spacing between these planes would be a divided by square root of 2. Right? That's 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 0 squared. That would be 2.38 angstroms if our cubic lattice cell constant is 3.36 angstroms. The 111 plane, the distance between those planes would be a divided by the square root of 3. Right? 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. That would be 1.94 angstroms. The 002 planes, or the 200 planes, or the 020 planes, their spacing would be A over 2. That would be a lattice spacing of 1.68 angstroms. So let's take a look at how those values um, map back onto the D spacing values that we calculated from the positions of our peaks in the powder diffraction pattern. 2.38, well, that's pretty close to the D spacing of our second peak. So let's assign that to be the 110 peak. 1.94, that's right where we expect for the 111 peak. And 1.68, that also shows up in our list of observed peaks. And so we assign that as the 200 peak. And you can go on and do this for successive peaks. And you see that each of the D spacings in this table can be assigned to a certain set of HKL values. How do we know which ones go with which? The key thing that we're looking at is that the sum of H squared plus K squared plus L squared is increasing as we go down. And as it increases, the D spacing is going to get smaller. We might also note that there are some integers that cannot be obtained by squaring three integers and summing them. So for example, seven is missing. There's no way to have three integers, square them, add them together to get seven. 15 is also missing. And if we went on, we would see that there's others that are missing. We also see that at least one example of two different sets of integers that would give the same value of h squared plus k squared plus l squared. The 221 and the 300, that sum would be 9 in both cases. So what that means is in a powder diffraction pattern, those two sets of peaks are going to come at exactly the same spot. And we won't be able to deconvolute them because they'll be precisely on top of one another. All right, so now at this stage, we have indexed our powder diffraction pattern. That is, we have assigned a set of Miller indices corresponding to planes in the lattice to each of the peaks in our powder diffraction pattern. And once we have done that, we know the dimensions of our unit cell and the shape of our unit cell. So in this case, it's a cubic unit cell, and we know that the cubic unit cell edge is uh, 3.34 angstroms. An important lesson to take home here is that the position of all 14 peaks in this pattern are determined by one variable, by the lattice parameter A. Now, if the crystal symmetry were lower, let's say it were tetragonal, you would have an A lattice parameter and a C lattice parameter. Then the positions of all the peaks would be determined by just two variables. And in the lowest possible symmetry case, a triclinic system, the positions of all the peaks would be dictated by at most six variables. Okay, so if we have a lot of peaks in the powder diffraction pattern, or in a single crystal diffraction pattern for that matter, 
the problem of determining the unit cell dimensions is overdetermined. It's also important to note that knowing the positions of all the peaks does not tell us anything about where the atoms are located in the unit cell. We're going to have to come back to that later. That is determined from the intensities of the peaks. You might also note when you look at this pattern, you know, there's, there is kind of a regular repeat to it, but then there's some places where it seems like there's a peak missing. So the peak that's missing here, well, this one, h squared plus k squared plus l squared, is 6, and this one, it's 8. So this is where the peak is missing that would be there if you could square three numbers and add them together and get 7. The peak that's seemingly missing here is the one that would be there if you could square three numbers, sum them, and get 15. Let's also think for a minute about, well, how many different diffraction peaks might we see? How many different interplanar spacings can you determine from a diffraction experiment? So another way to ask that question is to say, what's the smallest value of DHKL we can measure? Well, the DHKL is determined by the lambda and sine theta through Bragg's law. But of course, sine theta cannot be larger than 1, right? If we had a 2 theta angle of 180, that would give us a sine theta of 1. And both the geometry of a diffractometer and just the way a sine function works means that we can never make sine theta bigger than 1. If we were to use a copper source, which had a wavelength of 1.54 angstroms, it tells us that the smallest interplanar spacing we could measure is 0.77 angstroms. Uh, that would correspond in our polonium crystal to a LAS plane like 331. And we can't measure anything beyond that. This we call the resolution length of the experiment. So we cannot resolve any atoms that are closer together than this resolution length. Of course, 0.77 angstroms is small enough that we could resolve most chemical bonds that I can think of. But what would happen if the experiment were done in such a way that we didn't get data all the way out to the highest possible angle? What if we only collected our data out to 60 degrees 2 theta? That's pretty common when you're just doing a quick scan. Well, in that case, your resolution length would be given by this formula, lambda divided by 2 sine of 30, right? If 2 theta is 60, then theta is 30. And that would give us a resolution length of 1.54 angstroms. Now, 1.5 angstroms is only about the length of a carbon-carbon single bond. So if you had data and you only have peaks out to about 60 degrees with a copper source, you know, you can't really say anything about any bond distances shorter than this. So it wouldn't be very useful if you're trying to analyze, for example, some kind of organic molecule to only get data out to 60. Now you might say, well, I would just obviously collect to higher angles, and of course you should, but sometimes the quality of the crystal is such that the peak intensities drop off sufficiently fast that before you get out to the highest angles, there's no peaks left. That can happen because the positions of the atoms are not super well ordered within the crystal. There may be some uh, disorder between, let's say, molecules in a crystal. It can happen for a variety of reasons, but it's worthwhile remembering that you know, we can only extract a certain amount of information from a diffraction pattern, and it's limited by this D resolution. It, this becomes important when you're doing, for example, protein crystallography, where oftentimes the scattering doesn't go out to very high angles. It can also be a good reason why you might want to do an experiment with a shorter wavelength, with a molybdenum source, which has a wavelength of about half this value or at a synchrotron. Let's finish by seeing if you can take uh, powder diffraction data of a cubic crystal and analyze it to figure out things like the indexing of the peaks and the size of the unit cell. This is the powder diffraction pattern for magnesium oxide. Its crystal structure is shown up here. And we see of uh, these peaks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight peaks in the powder diffraction pattern. From this information, assign Miller indices to each of these peaks. So index the diffraction peaks, determine the length of the unit cell edge, A, 
and then determine the magnesium oxide distance, which as you can see is just half of A. I'm going to give you a little clue to get you started. The first thing we have to do is to convert these two theta values into D spacings. And so I've done that here in this table. These are the interplanar spacings for the diffraction peaks we see in the X-ray diffraction pattern. Using that information, can you carry out the steps that I asked on the previous slide? Did you make it or did you get stuck? Well, I'll go through the solution here and you can see if it matched with what you did. And if you got stuck, maybe you can see where you went wrong. Well, if we try to do this using the same approach we used on polonium, you know, our approach might be to say, all right, let's assume that that first peak is you know, the maximum, which would be the 100. Zero, the 100 zero is going to be the largest D spacing we're going to find. So if this peak at 36.9 degrees 2 theta is the 100 zero peak, that means the lattice parameter A must be 2.43 angstroms. So once we know that, remember knowing that tells us where all of the other peaks should be, let's calculate the positions of a few of those peaks and see if they match what we see in the experiment. So the next peak should be the 110 peak. Right? That will be a somewhat smaller D spacing. That's going to be equal to A over square root of 2. And if A is 2.43 angstroms, that peak should be found at 1.72 angstroms. Well, when we come over here and look through our list of D spacings, what we see is there is no peak with that D spacing. So something's wrong. Either this is not a cubic crystal, or that first peak is not the 100 peak. Those are really the only two possibilities. Well, I told you it's a cubic crystal, so let's throw out that possibility. And then we can come back and say, well, maybe that first peak is not 100. Maybe we have to make a guess that it's something else. Well, I guess you could go through and just keep guessing what the first peak is, but there's a little bit more systematic way to approach that, and that consists of making values of 1 over d squared. Now, why 1 over d squared? Well, from this formula up here, 1 over d squared is going to be equal to h squared plus k squared plus l squared over a squared. Now, for every single peak, h, k, and l are going to be different, but a is always going to be the same. So we could simplify this by taking out this term, which is a constant that's going to be the same for every single peak, and then this term here, h squared plus k squared plus l squared, which is going to be different for every peak. But that term has to be an integer. If we were to now divide all of these 1 over d squared values by the smallest 1 over d squared value we have, then we would get these values. Now, if this were the 1, 0, 0, then these would all be integers. That's what we saw in uh, the polonium case. But here, they're not all integers. However, notice that they're all either an integer or close to an integer plus a third or an integer plus two thirds. So if I were to multiply all of those by three, then they would all be integers. So then what does that mean? Well, I could come back to this step where I divide by this common factor, 0.169. I could divide by something that's three times smaller. And if I did that, then I would get integers in each division step. Right? So I'm going to divide not by 0.169, but I'm going to divide by one-third of that value. And when I do that, I get these values of integers. And those are the values that we must get when we take h squared plus k squared plus l squared. So that tells us that the first peak must be the 1, 1, 1, because the sum of the squares of these indices gives us 3. The second peak must be 2, 0, 0, because that would give us 4, and so on and so forth. Now you might notice if you look at this that, huh, there's a lot of peaks missing. The only peaks we see are ones where the h, k, and l are all either odd values 
or all either even values. And we'll learn later that that's exactly what you expect when you have a face-centered lattice. Now, having indexed it, the next step would be to determine the value of A, the cubic cell edge. And we could do that from any one of the peaks. So once you know the index and the despacing, we can use the formulas uh, that we've got up here to calculate the value of A. And so I've done that for each of the peaks, and you see that the values are all fluctuating around 4.22. So we can say that our lattice constant is 4.22 angstroms. And so now our task is complete. We can index the peaks, which I've done here. We've determined the unit cell edge, 4.22 angstroms, and then the distance from magnesium to oxygen is just because of the geometry of this crystal, half that, 2.11 angstroms. So that's kind of an introduction of how we might analyze a diffraction pattern. In later lectures, we're going to talk about cases where the crystal might not be cubic. And then after that, we'll get into analyzing the intensities to figure out where in the unit cell the atoms are located.